Welcome back to the Welsh History Podcast, episode 45, The Three C's That Spell Doom. It's been a while since we've discussed the historical story at the end of the 6th century and the beginning of the 7th century. In fact, much has changed for Wales and for the British in their fight with the Saxons and the Angles. The new kingdoms of the Saxons in the West have arisen. From Bede, we have the first stories of one of those kingdoms and its kings. The kings of Bernicia and Daira have defeated Elmet in the decades previous, and now appear to be striking west one more time to capture the links of the Old North to the British West. In the Yorkshire village known as Ketreth, or Catrick in English, it combined armies of the British and Angles fought for control of what would largely become northeastern England. The first sea, or Catrick, took place around 600 AD, which puts it roughly a quarter of a century after the defeat of the British at Deerholm in 575 AD. For this story, we have the remains of a legend, Gadothin, an epic poem found in what is now a collection of 13th century writings is considered to be, however, a far older poem. In fact, there is some suggestion that the, it was initially recorded not long after the battle, possibly 50 years or so after the battle. In the poem, it is put forward that the old northern kingdom of the Gadothan has called for help from the other British kingdoms and receives heroes to help them, 300 cavalrymen, and these 300 cavalrymen come to what becomes known to us today as Edinburgh. And there in Edinburgh, they feast and celebrate and prepare for battle. And it is written largely in a, in a way that is reminiscent of, I guess, the idea of the old 300 from the Thermopylae Persian Greek Wars, uh, that kind of failure but yet noble failure kind of viewpoint. Uh, to quote from the Gadothan, The men went to Catrek, need-nourished, sturdy and strong. It would be wrong, should I not praise them. Amid blood-red blades in dark blue sockets, the warhounds fought fiercely, tight formation. Of the war-band of Brennick, I would have thought it a burden to leave any in the shape of a man alive. A friend I have lost, faithful I was, swift in the struggle, it grieves me to leave him. The brave one desires not father-in-law's dowry, the son of Kayan from Mayan Kiwithin. The idea that they would gather and party for a year, going to the mead halls day in and day out, seems, of course, fanciful at this point. But at the same time, one could hear a bard or a storyteller speaking this story over the years, giving it in the sentiment of the tales of old heroes and of the failures and life lessons on the grand stage. The might of Britain had gathered, and they were going to celebrate. Men went to Catherick with the dawn. Their bravery cut short their lives. They drank yellow mead, sweet and ensnaring. For the space of a year the minstrel was merry, Red their swords, let them not be cleansed. Their shields were white, their spearheads fore-edged. Before the retinue of Midothan, Mythodog, Mythfaur. Of course, as we know now, the battle did not go well for the British armies, likely crushed in their attack of the Angles and their allies. While we cannot be sure if it was the kingdom of Deira or Bernicia, or as... Bede contends the combined might of the two kingdoms as Northumbria, who fought in the battle with the men from Edinburgh and their allies, the results were categorically one of failure. Again, to go back to the Gadothan, 300 gold torque men attacked, guarding their lands, bloody was their slaughter. Although they were slain, they slew. Until the end of the world they were honored, and all of us kinsmen who went together Sad, but for one man, not as none escaped. Of course, this is a haunting tale and a sad one for those that remembered it. In future times, as we think about these kind of epic poems, of course, our ideas and our, our understandings of them have changed. 
and the way we look at them has changed as well. Obviously, they don't have quite the same resonance for people these days as they would have had back then. And in a way, it also seems to harken back to a time period which probably never existed of honor and of the concepts of bravery and how people fought and, and lived and died. And that concept is very common in, in epic poetry and in in stories that are considered to be sort of prophetic or possibly something of uh, an honor legend of these people. And certainly they have that sense to them. And in a way, while it does give us some ideas about the way fighting worked in those days, the idea that you would use war dogs, for example, um, it doesn't give us huge amounts of information about the battle. It, it's just a poem, effectively, so you, you only have, have sort of guesses. In a way, not dissimilar from the Odyssey and the Iliad are for Homer, you know, and the Trojan War. We don't know that much of the Trojan War based on what Homer discussed. All we know is there was a war that there's probably a place called Troy, and there was a war with it. <laughs> Largely, other than that, we're not entirely sure how much to take as face value. And history is a difficult thing to get your head around sometimes. If there's one thing we know about history of the late 6th century is that we know a lot less than some think we do, and this is especially the case around the Battle of Cataract. Most of what we do know comes from mythological stories and a tiny bit of actual fact. The links to the old British North and Wales were established in the founding myths of at least two kingdoms in medieval Wales. Cunetha and the Sons of Godothan is claimed as the first kingdom of Gwynedd. His sons were kings of even more Welsh northern kingdoms. These are all legendary figures, but yet the links to the Old North are important to the Welsh at this stage, and remain so even after the Old North is gone. And this connection of the Old North in southern Scotland to North Wales has led over the years to speculation of how much of this myth and legends and tales of poets comes from Wales or from southern Scotland. The mythology behind the Lost Kingdoms is very strong in the 9th century and onward in Wales, at least until Edward I. So that's the first C that we are discussing. The second C, however, stands for Chester. Chester is a obviously a, a town and city in western England, but it also is an important community at this point in time in the Kingdom of Powys. Uh, the city is a hotly contested one as it controls access to the Irish Sea in the west and access between the Old North and its allies in Wales. Now, in old scholarship, they believe that this battle was a key one in dividing the Old North from the South, and, and to some extent this is true, but it's true only because of the damage it does and the way it builds the Northumbrian the Northumbrians up as a kingdom it's not physically able to separate them at this stage because of the obviously the trade that was going on across the Irish Sea the likelihood that and the archaeological evidence points out that there isn't a lot of Anglican settlements to the west until much later at this point and as we'll go on and talk about, there are other reasons why we can say that this isn't exactly a good measuring stick. However, there is archaeological evidence of this battle having taken place in the fact that they have found uh, burial mounds of people who have been obviously in a battle from this period of time. So it's one of actually the earliest sites where we can show for sure that there was conflict between what seems to be a British tribe and an Anglican slash Saxon group. Um, uh, the Bernician, to get to the initial story, uh, the battle, depending on the author, editor, or scribe, dates in quite a wide variety of, of numbers, but it can range anywhere as early as 605 AD to 616 AD. Uh, likely didn't happen in 616 simply because of the battles that would happen after the fact, but it may have. Uh, but 605 does seem early, especially based on the Battle of Catholic being so much, you know, only a few years before. Also, you have the uniting of 
Deira and Bernicia in 604 with the coming of Aethelfrith as the king of those two lands and the driving out of Edwin, who will become important later, and how these two kingdoms then basically unify to fight the British. Um, the battle is also known for having been covered both by Bede and various chronicles from both the English and Welsh perspectives. Uh, Bede obviously will focus on, pretty much in all of his writings, his focus is really about the, the English church and the rise of the English church. So it's, he's not focusing totally on the battles and the people and everything. But unlike Gildas and others who were doing similar, he did detail kings and important people outside of the church names. And there is historical evidence of these people, which is a lot more difficult when it comes to like the writings of Gildas, who's not writing a history, but rather writing a, um, a, a polemic. So in his case, he mentions, he's one of the first ones to mention Aethelfrith as the king. And Aethelfrith was also one of those people who would be powerful enough to gather a large army together. He was likely the king in command at Cethrac, which would make sense if he was looking to expand his kingdom, as it would have given him control of the east coast from Scotland to Anglia, uh, especially if you kick in a few years later, adding Bernicia's, or Daira's power base. Now all of a sudden you've got quite a wide, sizable territory, which he now suddenly controls. And of course, in the process, starts to push westward, dominating Elmet, of course, they had already started that process if they hadn't done it by then, and starting to move towards Chester, which, as I said, was a key point. Chester, as it turns out, was key for a couple of different reasons. One, it was the site of a former legionary fort. In fact, in, in Old Welsh, it was, it was equivalent to being called Caerleon, or the legionary fort, and had been sort of the, the main standpoint for the legion in North Wales and in the northeast of England at the time of that of the Roman settlements. It remained an important place even after that fact, and much like Roxeter, which was the kind of the seat of power for Powys at the time, it was an important Roman hangover, if you want to call it that, uh, from the old period, which remained at least in some sense of use. Roxeter is important because of Roxeter, uh, which is also known as Verconium Cornovirium, is the not only being the first major seat of power, it's also the probably an old civitas, an administration point for the old Roman Britain, and also was associated with Vortigern. In fact, the, the descendants of the kings of Powys claimed Vortigern, at least partially, as one of their ancestors and that his Vortigern's wife was the daughter of uh, Maximus, the last British emperor who tried to take over the Western Roman Empire. So there's a lot of linkages to those two things. Now, of course, we know that Vortigern is a legendary figure, so it's hard to say if he ever existed. Powys is a major player at this stage in, in fighting the Saxons, and probably... Part of this comes down to why they don't get as much flack to a degree by Gildas and why they're a key player in the battles that will take place shortly. Uh, the king of Powys at the time was uh, Selef Apkinen. Uh, that's who the Welsh annals suggest was the king of Powys at the time. And in fact, it's claimed through these annals that he actually took on king of the Britons in the Battle of Chester. Uh, likely this title may have been like being a high king. It could have been like war leader, similar to what people think happened with, uh, figures like Ambrosius Arianus. And we do know that he was sort of seen as being the one in charge. He and his sub kingdom allies in Rouse, for example, uh, went into the battle against the Angles, probably with the support of the Northern uh, British. And it, the numbers here are very pecu 
peculiar because we know in ancient battles that numbers are often skewed and that the idea that you would have what amounts to roughly 50,000 troops on the field for the Angles seems very, very high to me. I think likely that number is probably wrong. I think most scholars agree that that number sounds very peculiar. But to justify the idea that, as uh, writers like Jeffrey of Monmouth have said, and take, as I've said in the past, his words with a grain of salt, that there was 10,000 uh, Anglican soldiers who were killed in that battle, this idea seems a bit of a stretch. I think likelihood is is that even at its peak, Northumbria is probably not marching 50,000 troops in that area. Uh, we have to understand that Britain at this time is probably under a million people total. So the concept that there would be that many people coming out of one kingdom to fight in a battle, I mean, that's a lot of male soldiers who are willing to fight in a battle of that size. And I, I think likely that's probably not even close to the actual numbers. But it's hard to say for sure, and we don't really know. So all we have is the numbers that are quoted, so we can't go on anything else beyond that. But that's that's something you have to keep in mind, is that there's largely exaggerations when it came to battle numbers and troops and things of that nature. So we can't just accept them at face value. Um, what Aethelfrith obviously did is he took Catrek, then turned south and joined his kingdom to Daira, then went west to try and take on these other kingdoms. They defeated the Powys king and his allies at Chester. And as we said, there's archaeological evidence to show us that likely this battle is accurate in the fact that it was a large battle, that there was enough to give credence to what Bede had said. Now, Bede's focus becomes on the monks that are there. In fact, he mentioned that there were 1,200 uh, Welsh monks from Bangor who were actually at the site of this battle. Now again, I think that claim might be slightly askew. It sounds like a massive exaggeration if I was to be blunt, because that's a heck of a lot of monks to come to the field. And his claim was they were praying for a Christian victory to overcome the Angles, and that uh, Aethelfrith basically focused on them and then wipe them out uh, to, in effect, make an example of them. And in Bede's translation of that, it, it comes out, of course, that it's it's a it's a prophecy of revenge from from Augustine, who we'll get into more next episode, and his uh, ideas that the Welsh would pay the price for not having converted their fellows in the Anglo-Saxon regions. And this was a meaning of why that would have happened. Um, and it was retribution, in effect. And, as I said, we'll discuss this more later. And again, like I said, some of these battle numbers will widely skew things. And I think we have to understand that they could be off by as much as a power of 10. You know, instead of 1,200 monks, we might have 120 monks. It's hard to really say. And all we can do is I can quote you the numbers that they're quoting me, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're accurate. It, in fact, it seems wildly optimistic, if I was to put it that way, to say that there were that many troops and that many monks in the field at that time in that sort of situation. Um, Chester becomes a significant point because of a couple of different reasons. Obviously, the fact that these kings were killed uh, puts a power vacuum in the Welsh East. It creates a problem because now it emboldens the Northumbrians. Uh, in fact, the amount of Angles that were killed there probably causes problems for Aethelfrith because within a short period of time, he ends up being killed by Edwin and his father-in-law, Raidwald, uh, at a battle uh, just south of Elmet called the uh, River Idol, Battle of the River Idol. Uh, and Edwin now takes control. The heir of Deira becomes the heir of Northumbria, and he now takes control of this massive land. His control now of this area also pushes his own agenda, and his agenda basically is the same as Aethelfrith's, which is he wants more land, more control. He wants to go north, he wants to go east, and he's going to push his control of the other kingdoms 
in the south in Saxon lands and in fact does become sort of the Brethwald or the head king over many other kings in the Saxon area and as well he will take his military and they will march into the lands of the Irish and the Scottish in northern uh, northern England and southern Scotland but as well he becomes the first king to actually push into Gwyneth and will defeat the armies of the Gwyneth troops and basically put them into a sub-kingdom role and he creates probably his own problems because of this ambition. I think if we look at the history of this it will come back to haunt him from the final C makes the stage. Uh, Edwin may have been the first Christian king of the Angles but he was one where power was of absolute dominance. He attacked as far west as Gwyneth bringing even the strongest Welsh kingdom to heal along with much of the power of the Saxon south fell to his control. Much of He now controlled much of what he wanted, but in doing so had set the seeds for his downfall. In 625, just possibly ten years after the humbling of Powys, Cadwallon ap Cadfan came to the throne of Gwynedd, or at least that's the story. In he is our final C in our three C's. Four years later is the first mention of him from a historical standpoint when he fights an unsuccessful battle against Edwin in 629. Cadwallon was defeated and forced into exile where he flees to Ireland, uh, eventually coming back and he will become the haunter of Edwin and his people and will actually come to dominance there and he will bring with him the last major reign of a Welsh monarch until Henry Tudor uh, to England and his abilities and his successes we will talk about further but he also happens to be the last reason and the last evidence of the old linkages still working and after him it's this is where everything really does break down into Scotland Wales and Cornwall and no longer will we have a united kingdom of Britain or a united Britain in any way, shape, and form until much, much later. And because of this, we get our firmed up nations. And Cadwallon is an interesting figure as well because while the stories talk about him as being a king of Gwyneth, there are some who argue that instead of being a king of Gwyneth, he's actually a king in the Old North. And we'll talk about that a little further as well next time when we do discuss Cadwallon in a couple of weeks. And uh, I hope uh, you've enjoyed this episode. And uh, if you have comments, concerns, or anything, you can reach me at the Welsh History Podcast at gmail.com. You can find out all the things that we do for my channel and for our content on distractionsmedia.com. By the way, uh, we do have a contest going uh, starting last week, and it will go to the end of this month uh, for someone who wants to win a, a t-shirt from one of our stores. Across all our other content, we have a series of RPG games that we do a live play aspect to. And so what we've asked people to do is to write a fictional story based on those characters or even the podcasters themselves. And uh, if they do, they can will be eligible to win, especially as we will sit down and pick the best stories and probably give out at least two t-shirts at gmail.com. With that, uh, if you have further questions or want to talk to me online, you can talk to me on Twitter at the Welsh History Pod or at my own personal Twitter account, John DMP. And you can find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Welsh History Podcast. And I hope you guys have a great week. A great day, and thank you so much for listening. Take care. Bye. This has been a Distractions Media production. For more information, you can check out everything we do at distractionsmedia.com.